while. I've been out of pocket. Uh, again, tonight Dad's out of pocket, but I've been out of pocket for uh, a little while. Uh, so it's good to be back. Um, and we, we, again, are picking up in 2 Samuel 19. It's been a little while since we've been here. Uh, so let's go back and remember a couple things before we, uh, so before we sort of delve into the heart of the matter. Uh, remember that Absalom's rebellion has been put down. That happened at the end of chapter 18. David is in the process of returning to Jerusalem again, having dealt with his own emotions as a father uh, in connection to the fact that, you know, again, this was not just a, re- you know, this was not just a rebel that was put down. This is also a son that was killed. Um, and, and, of course, you know, David is in the process of moving beyond that. Uh, and, and what we saw in or later on in chapter 19 basically what we looked at i think last time is that uh, david's in the process of coming back across the jordan river uh, because where he's been has been east of the jordan river he's on his way back to sort of mainland israel we might could say and as he's on his way back he's encountering people that had supported him so individuals again like zadok and abithar uh, the priest, other individuals as well, uh, as we see uh, Ziba, who was a servant of Mephibosheth. We see Mephibosheth as well. And then we saw, of course, uh, Shimei, who had been an opponent of David, that, again, had basically come to the recognition, you know, I've been wrong, David, I want your uh, forgiveness. I want to be forgiven uh, for my treachery against you. And as we've seen before, and we've pointed out, out this a lot, David's a very good example of a man that is willing to forgive others. Uh, and in this particular case, a man that had cursed him and basically said, you know, God is doing this to you, David, much like the friends of Job uh, tried to get Job or tried to convince Job, you know, Job, you're suffering because God wants you to suffer because he's making you pay for your sins. Um would have been very hard for most people to to offer or to be able to forgive somebody in that situation. Yet David, of course, is a man that uh, has needed forgiveness in his own life and then is is also willing to give forgiveness to those that seek it. That happened with Shimei. The last thing that we talked about was, again, the the dispute between Mephibosheth and and, uh, Ziba. Uh, Remember, Mephibosheth's point was that, you know, David... I would have liked to have been with you, but I'm lame on my feet. I can't just, you know, get up on an animal like any normal person can and go and, and meet with you when David was on the run outside of, outside of Jerusalem. Um, and so, again, Mephibosheth and Ziba, David's uh, command in verse 29 was, again, to divide the land. Um, and then Mephibosheth just makes a simple request. Again, let him take it all, verse 30. Now... 31, uh, and we, we'll try to get into chapter 20 tonight, but we, we're sort of picking up in that same section. And whereas it seems as though things have been restored to normal in Israel, uh, what we see is that they have not. Uh, again, the Civil War has been put down. Uh, I know, I think I mentioned when we talked about this last time, uh, you know, within our own country's history. You know, during the Civil War, the leaders in the Union were thinking about, you know, how even after the Civil War, how are we going to mend relations between the North and the South? Because there could still be some animosity. Um, And that's what's going to happen tonight, uh, is that even though Absalom is killed, there's the animosity between Israel and Judah is not necessarily uh, done away with. And we'll get down to that in verse 40. But we have one final individual that is specifically noted to us that comes to meet David. Um, And and this is a man that in this section is a a man that we want to give proper uh, honor to based on based on how based on his response to uh, David's request. So second Samuel chapter 19. Let's look now in verse 31. And Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rogelum and went across the Jordan with the king to escort him across the Jordan. Now Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old, and he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very rich man. 
So here we have another one of David's supporters, like Ziba, like Zadok and Abiathar. Barzillai was one of those individuals that had support David, supported David when he was on the run, when in a sense he wasn't even the king. He'd been deposed. And what we note here about Barzillai is that he is also there with David, basically as the welcoming party with David when David crosses over into Israel, right? The, the individuals that we've read about have all come to basically welcome David back into Israel. Uh, now, this hasn't happened in our countries. At least this hasn't happened. In, from my understanding, this really hasn't happened a lot in our country's history. But um, within some other countries that maybe are not as, uh, the leadership is not as solidified, uh, where they, you know, you have constant threats of a revolt, uh, I think like what's going on in Sri Lanka right now. Sometimes when a deposed leader is welcomed back, there are people there that welcome him back in. And that's what Barzillai is, is acting, acting here. He's been an ally with David, but now he wants to be there to officially welcome David back and, and officially kind of welcome him back as the, the king. Now we know about Barzillai from this description here. He's an old man. He's 80 years old. We also know that he is one of the individuals that actually had provided David and his men supplies when, he had, when David stayed at Mahanai. Now, remember that this is a reference to 2 Samuel 17. Remember that Absalom had followed Hushai's advice. And Hushai had said to Absalom, look, we need all the men that we can get. Let's take time to gather all the people of Israel, get the military all assembled and then go and pursue after David. And we talked about how that provided time for David and his men basically to catch their breath. And in 2 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 27, one of the individuals that came to David and his men at Mahanai, we're told, is this same Barzillai the Gileadite. And now he has come with, and, and while he helped David out specifically there, He's come to, to welcome him back. Again, remember that what Barzillai provided David was a lot more than food. If you recall back in 1727, things like beds, shelter, and obviously food connected into that. Uh, this was a man that had helped David and his men out very much. Um, and, and the note there that he's a very rich man sort of is connected to that. He had the resources to help David out. And so naturally, David is going to want to return the favor, right? Somebody's helped me out when I was in a lot of desperate need. Here, here you have this older man. He's 80 years old. At that time, again, probably not able to work. And even though he's very wealthy, David's mindset is I want to help provide for this man because he helped me out. Verse 33, the king said to Barzillai, come across with me and I will provide for you while you are with me in Jerusalem. So David's request is, Bar Barzillai, let me take care of you. And the, the, the statement that's being made here by David, and again, Barzillai is a very wealthy man, but not only would you know, Barzillai, not, would, Barzillai would get to enjoy sort of the comforts of the king's house, but he'd also get to enjoy the protection of the king's house. Maybe something that his wealth could not have, have had for him. And, and so David's point is, look, Barzillai, you helped me out when I was deposed as king. Now that I am become king, let me help you out because you had helped me out while I was on the run. Let me provide for you when you come over with me into Jerusalem. Now, that's a very tempting offer. Uh, again, not just, not just being able to live with the, in, inside the king's house, but also become an advisor to the king. You know, there's a sort of a rank that you sort of establish yourself being put in this position. But Barzillai's response here um, is, is a very wise response, uh, in my opinion. Verse 34, Barzillai said to the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? Barzillai, because he's 80 years old, um, and I, I know the, the passage, Psalm 90, verse 10, 
comes to mind here where Moses is talking about uh, living to a long, older age. You know, Barzillai hears it a very, as an older age in life. And his point is, again, you know, David, I don't know how long I have to live. That's the, that's the question. How long have I to live that I should go up with the king of Jerusalem? David, I don't know how much longer I will live. I'm an old man is, is, what, is what he's saying here. You know, I'm kind of too old for this. I know some of you are that, that are older. Um, maybe you find this to be true where you don't travel as much as you used to because, you know, traveling now uh, at an older age is, is sort of more taxing on the body or, or taxing mentally. Um, you know, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I know my, my dad and mom, uh, when the, and they're, they're obviously not advanced of age. That's not what I'm saying. But in terms of us driving, for instance, um, dad and mom can, can drive for a, a good while, you know, without getting tired. Um, but a couple years ago, I went with a couple of friends down to a Mississippi State game in Florida, um, and I drove back from Jacksonville, which was about a 10 and a half hour drive. I drove straight through, uh, and I didn't, didn't phase me because uh, I'm younger. Uh, but my parents couldn't do that. I think about this, I also think about my grandparents too. Um, my, my grandparents, obviously, they don't come down here as much. My dad's parents don't because just physically they cannot handle the traveling as much. Um, just because of physical issues, obviously, you know, my granddad and grandma, you know, it, it, they're, they're more comfortable at home where they're at. And um, it's just easier for them to stay at home than it is to get them in the car and for Aunt Janice to, to drive down here. So we try to go up there more than they come down here. Um, and that's the idea. Just sometimes you get to a point in life where, you know, just because of your advanced age, it, it's hard for you to travel. And, and keep in mind here, Barzillai is not thinking about traveling in a car with an air conditioner, with cushioned seats and things like that. The travel here you're talking about is probably on an animal. Uh, and if you've ridden on a horse or any type of animal, you know that it's not the most comfortable thing. Uh, and it becomes less comfortable as, as you get older in life. And, and that's what he's saying here. You know, I, I am sort of too old for this thing. So verse 35 Again, I am today 30, 80 years old. Can I discern between the good and bad? And here, Barzillai sort of is willing to admit, perhaps, that maybe his mind is not as sharp as it once was. Now, I know when we see that phrase, the, the, the question, can I discern between the good and the bad, we might think about the idea of, of right and wrong, and maybe that's what he's referring to here. But... He's also referring to the fact that his mind is not as sharp as it once was. Uh, the ability to distinguish between what is good and what is bad. David might have had in mind that Barzillai becomes an advisor to him within the court. And, and Barzillai is just admitting, you know, David, my mind is not as sharp as it once was. I may not be as much of a benefit to you in that position. And, I, and if you want to put a passage in, in your Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, especially verses 2, I think down through verse 8, sort of tie in with what Barzillai is saying here. Um, because in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1, we probably remember that verse because Solomon wrote, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Uh, and the reason why he writes that is because of the verses that follow. And it's a very... Uh, vivid image of a lot of things, but it represents the human body sort of declining as it gets older. And, and that sort of ties in with what Barzillai is, is getting at, right? My mind is not as sharp as it once was. Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? That could be a reference to the fact that, again, David is king, perhaps had people that ta taste tested the food to make sure that it's not poison, to make sure that it's of good quality. It could also refer to the fact that he has lost his taste. Again, the king's possessions would have been the best of the best. He'd have the best, uh, you know, he'd have the best, uh, he, he'd have the best food. He'd have the best drink. And, and, and if what he's saying here is that I've lost my taste, I cannot enjoy those things as maybe somebody else could, David. So I'm not, I cannot go there is the idea. Can I hear any longer the voice of singing men and singing women? 
Uh, this would be the idea of maybe of entertainment. Uh, again, there are no such thing as hearing aids for Barzillai. Barzillai's point is, you know, I can't enjoy that type of entertainment anymore. I can't hear very well. And so it doesn't really make sense for me to go. Why then should your servant be a further burden to my Lord the King? So don't be a burden is his mindset. Uh, He he doesn't want to be a burden in that sense. He's not going to be of any help to David. And and, and, and in my mind, probably what Barzillai is also thinking here too, um, and I think it ties in pretty well, and I think some of y'all probably can relate to this, you know, you kind of want to stay where you grew up in a sense. You know, your families live there perhaps in that location, uh, maybe Barzillai grew up in that area, and you know that's just where he wants to live the rest of his life. He doesn't want to have to get up and move everything to Jerusalem. He'd rather just stay uh, there uh, in Rajalem, where he had, where he and his family had been. Um, and and for a lot of people, I, and maybe you're in that position, that's what you desire in life. You don't want to move again. You want to stay where your family is or where you grew up, uh, because you know that's what's most comfortable to you. And that's kind of what Barzillai's overall point is. I want to I want to stay where I'm at. Again, don't take that as an offense, David. Uh, note what he says in verse 36. Your servant will go a little way across the Jordan with the king, or I'll sort of see you to the official welcoming, uh, you know, moment when you when you for, when you plant your feet across the Jordan River and, and into mainland Israel. I'll be there with you then. But then I'm going to go back home. Why should the king repay me with such a reward? Now, this is a point that, to me, I want to emphasize a lot. Because this is going to sort of contrast what we see at the end of the chapter. And this is a very good point for us to think about as a point of application. Why should the king repay me with such a reward? This would not just refer to what he's doing now. Uh, This would also refer to what he did in chapter 17, where he helped the king that was on the run. And Barzillai's point is, look, David, I did what was expected of me, right? I did what my responsibility was as a citizen of Israel to support the man that God had put in charge. I did what was my duty. I don't necessarily deserve all this reward that you plan on giving me because I just did what anybody should have done. You know, we might, you might have seen that. In, in the news sometimes you know, a person does a heroic act and he might he or she might make the statement you know I just did what anybody else would do and they don't want a great reward and I think that's a great mindset to have because when we get to the New Testament you know that's not the mindset that the followers of Jesus always had remember that there was at least one occasion where the apostles were quarreling amongst themselves arguing who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven who would get the best reward, the highest position within, in their minds, Jesus' earthly government. And Jesus' was, point was, again, you, you kind of missed the whole point here. I want, you, I want us to turn in our Bibles for a moment to Matthew chapter 20. Because Barzillai's attitude here is sort of the opposite of what Peter's had been in Matthew uh, chapter 20. Now, we might remember this for being the parable of the hired workers, but it it deals with with Peter's attitude, which sometimes might be an attitude that we can develop too. In chapter 19, remember that there was a wealthy, rich, young ruler that had come to talk to Jesus, and we know that he was a very good man, couldn't, couldn't part with his possessions. He went away sorrowful. Remember that after that had happened, Peter looked back on what he and basically the other apostles had done and sort of looked at what what they had done and and thought to himself, well, we deserve a great reward. Matthew 19, verse 27, Peter said to Jesus, see, we have left all their jobs and things of that nature and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? And Peter's expectation was because we have sacrificed more, we deserve to be rewarded more. 
Maybe like what somebody would expect in Barzillai's position. Again, you know, Barzillai had been there when David was on the run. Barzillai could have easily have said, you know, this is exactly what I should have been given because I helped you out more than some of the other Israelites did. But remember that Jesus' point in Matthew chapter 20 with a parable of the hired workers is that there were different stages in where workers were hired, but they were all paid the exact same for their work. Some were paid in the morning, or some began working in the morning, some began at the, the middle of the day, some began late at the day. And when they all had finished working that day, they were all paid the same thing. And some people would say that that's not fair, but Jesus pointed out here that it is the responsibility or it is the uh, gift of the, uh, of the hirer that he can determine what the pay is, right? Because he's the one that provided the job. And Jesus' overall point to Peter was is that it doesn't matter if you think you sacrificed a lot more. There's nothing that you could have sacrificed that would have merited you receiving salvation. And as a result of that, Peter, what Jesus was trying to get Peter to see is that, again, it doesn't matter whether you obey the gospel early in life. It doesn't matter where you, whether you obey the gospel later in life. You're going to receive the same reward. But that point was also true in terms of the work that we put in, right? You know, some people, uh, again, some people uh, may have a lot of abilities that they can do for the church. Some people may not have the same or as many abilities in terms of helping out the church. And sometimes people that have more ability that think that they do more, sometimes it, it gets easily in our minds that, Perhaps, you know, we deserve a greater reward in heaven than those who did not do as much as we did. Well, Jesus' point to Peter was, don't think like that because you all earn the same reward because you did nothing from the outset to merit that reward. And that's, that's a point that we have to keep in mind to ourselves, Right? We all receive the same reward. We can't get caught up in trying to figure out, you know, well, I did more than you or you did more than me. Uh, because Jesus pointed out in Matthew 20, that, 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 that idea is fruitless. It doesn't do any benefit. Barzillai recognizes that in 2 Samuel 19. Again, here's a man that could have said, you know, David, I deserve all the blessings of the king's house because I was there when you were on the run. Yet his, his mindset was, why should the king repay me with such a reward? In other words... David, I just did what was expected of me. I don't deserve more than somebody else because all I did was the requirement of an Israelite citizen to support the king and to support God's chosen man. And that's why I think this passage says a lot about Barzillai. He's an older man, obviously wise in the sense that he, he sort of recognizes he'd rather be at home, but he's also wise in the sense that, you know, he just did what would have been expected of anybody. So, I think that's a good point to keep in mind. Nevertheless, though, verse 37, Please let your servant turn back again that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and mother. But here is your servant Chimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king and do for him what seems good to you. And that's... Barzillai's overall point, right? I'd rather be buried where my family is. Some of you may have already gotten that into order. You know, think about thinking about where you plan on being buried, you know, eventually later on in time. Most people like to be buried by their family. That was a custom then, that's a custom today, and, and obviously he wants to be buried with his family, which may not have happened if he was if he was to live in Jerusalem. But notice that Barzillai will send a servant, Chimham. And depending on your translation, you might actually have uh, son there. There are some translations, I believe, that have the word son, uh, which could have meant that this is a son of, of Barzillai, but uh, I, I think it's more appropriate to say a servant. But Shemham's going to go with you, David, rather than myself. And that's probably to recognize, again, David's uh, uh, or, or offering, right, that, that had been... The, the, uh, the offer that had been made uh, to Barzillai. So David answers, verse 38, The king answered, Chimham shall cross over with me, and I will do for him what seems good to you. Now whatever you request of me, I will do for you. 
And then all the people went over the Jordan. And when the king had crossed over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him. And he returned to his own place. So, everything seems perfect. Again, Barzillai and David, they part on very good terms. David, again, is uh, affirms and is very certain here. Look, Barzillai, if you never need anything, let me know. I'll come and help you out any way that you can. Everything seems fine. Well, not that will not be the case. Verse 40. See, that old dispute between Israel and Judah hadn't been settled yet. Verse 40. Now, the king David went on to Gilgal, which was, if you keep in mind, that was sort of the first stop that the Israelites made when uh, Joshua led the Israelites into the land of Canaan. Gilgal is a very important city. The king went on to Gilgal. Shem, Ham went on with him. And all the people of Judah escorted the king and also half the people of Israel. Just then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king, his household, and all David's men with him across the Jordan? Now, even though Israel had been the enemies of David, they are not upset that David has returned. They're upset by how he has returned. Keep in mind that Israel had been the supporters of Absalom, but keep in mind also that they were the first group of people when the rebellion was put down to recognize, look, things were better when David was king. Let's welcome David back in and let's restore him to being the king over Israel. Remember that we talked about in chapter 19, earlier on at least, that it was the people of Judah that were more hesitant. They were not the first to suggest bringing David back. So when these, the men of Israel in verse 41, when they see that it's primarily the people of Judah escorting the king back, they're upset. It wasn't the people of Judah's idea to do this, at first at least, right? It was our idea to do that, to welcome David back. And yet, why are we not given the credit for it? Right? The people of Judah are the ones that are sort of in the kingly procession welcoming him, him back. The people of Israel saying, well, that should be, a lot more of us should have been there too. Why are we not involved in that? Uh, and again, I think there's a natural contrast here, right? The attitude of the men of Israel versus the attitude of Barzillai. Barzillai didn't care about his reward. The people of Israel, at least here in verse 41... They're the exact opposite. They want their reward for coming up with this idea first. So verse 42, the dispute continues. So all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, because the king is a close relative of ours, why then are you angry over this matter? Have we ever eaten at the king's expense or has he given us any gift? Now, the people of Judah simply respond by saying, look, David's one of our own. David's one of our own. We're going to be the ones to welcome him back, right? We're family. Um, you know, if you've ever seen, uh, you, you know, sometimes in our, in our country when soldiers return from being overseas, um, a lot of times it's the family that's the first people there at the airport to welcome them back. Uh, we, we kind of understand that. Uh, and that's what, the, that's what the idea of the people of Judah are, are saying, right? We're family. We should be the first ones there to welcome them back as part of this party. Now, they also point out here, right, have we ever eaten at the king's expense or has he given us any gift? Now, what that refers to is the fact that David had not shown any type of significant favorability towards the people of Judah versus the other tribes of Israel. David had not been partial in that matter. Uh, and that's what they're saying here, right? We have not benefited more than the rest of Israel because of the fact that David is from uh, the tribe of Judah. If you remember uh, with, the, uh, with King Saul, that was not necessarily the case. There's a, there a time where uh, King Saul gave the best of the best to, to his men and to the uh, tribe of Benjamin. Whereas Saul had done that, David had not. Judah had not prospered more than the other tribes of Israel, so they don't understand why they're angry. And in verse 43, the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, 
We have ten shares in the king, therefore we also have more right to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Now this phrase, we have ten shares in the king, and that we have a more, more right to David than you, from my understanding, that's just simply the fact that, you know, when you think about the tribes of Israel, um, you know, Israel's primarily made up of the ten northern tribes. And their point again is, right, there are ten other tribes here, right? We have more of a say than just the one tribe of Judah is their point, right? We, we should have had some say in how this went out. We should have been there or we should have been part of that procession welcoming David back in. And obviously, again, right, were we not the first to advise bringing back our king, right? We thought of it first. Why are we not included? But note there at the end that the words of the men of Judah were fiercer uh, than the words of the men of Israel. And that is going to lead to problems in the next chapter because whereas the, the men of Judah, the, the words are fiercer or that, um, again, the idea that the, the actions uh, of the people of Judah sort of went out over what Israel wants in this situation, uh, that leads to problems in chapter 20 because, again, there's going to be another rebellion in Israel, although it's going to be uh, short, relatively short-lived compared to Absalom's rebellion. Now, as we think about this chapter again, as we draw to a close at the end of this chapter, and we'll get into chapter 20, uh, at least a couple verses in there. Um, as we draw a close to this chapter, again, we want to keep in mind what's being contrasted here in, in verses 31 in the end of the chapter. You got the ideas of selflessness versus the ideas of selfishness. Barzillai exemplified what a selfless attitude was. I do what's expected of me. I don't deserve or I don't expect anything more. We as Christians are, again, called to have a selfless attitude. Peter didn't have that attitude, right? He thought because he's an apostle, because he gave up more than the other people that would later on follow Jesus, because he was a disciple for longer than other people, he felt like he was entitled to a lot more in life. In a, in, a, in a spiritual sense, a greater eternal reward. Much like the people here, of men and Ju the men of Judah and the people of Israel, are sort of squabbling about who should get the, the, the prominence of being there welcoming David in. Right? They're much like Peter in that situation. That's the selfish idea. The selfish idea leads to problems, as we will see in chapter 20. The selfish idea can lead to problems within the church as well. A lot of times if we're concerned about who gets the credit for what, that can lead to division. It can lead to members of the congregation getting angry and upset at one another. It can lead to splits within congregations. And, and again, these are things that have happened before. A lot of times because there are some people that are too busy concerned about who gets the credit rather than making sure that the job gets done. And, you know, if that had been the mindset of the people in Israel and Judah, perhaps... We don't read about Sheba's rebellion in chapter 20. If they had the mindset like Barzillai, you know, again, tension doesn't get out of hand. People are not killed because they have a selfless attitude uh, about, uh, about how they respond to... Um, uh, they have a selfless attitude when it comes to the idea of getting praise. They're not concerned about who gets the praise just so much that the job gets done. And that's a nice contrast of Barzillai versus the people of Israel and the people of Judah. And we'll go ahead and get into chapter 20. Uh, we'll look at the first two verses. All right, so some time has passed, but from what we understand, maybe not too long. There happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. Again, keep in mind, this is the, the tribe of Saul. He blew a trumpet and said, We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem remained loyal to their king. Now this is a direct response to what was left off in the prior chapter. The words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. The people of Israel felt like because of David's 
apparent, in their mind, apparent partiality or their favorability towards the, people, the, the uh, tribe of Judah. They felt that, you know, at this point, our best option is to rebel again, right? Split ourselves off. We have no share in David. Uh, we don't have any future of prospering is the idea under the leadership of David. So every man to his tents. That's not just a call to rebellion, but that's, again, a sign of, I mean, obviously it's a sign of rebellion, but it's a sign of great discontent. And that's why we see that every man of Israel deserts David. They feel like David has sort of spited them, when in reality he hasn't. So they follow after Sheba. The men of Judah are going to remain loyal to King David uh, because, again, they were right, they're, they're right there with David, uh, bringing him back in. Well, we'll go ahead and stop here tonight. Um, are there, is there any comments or questions about what we've talked about tonight? I know I haven't taken any time for that. If not, we will pick up in chapter 20 and verse 3. Uh, that will be a week from Sunday. Uh, but again, thank you for your time and thank you for your attention uh, tonight.